If you've seen this channel before, you know that I not only focus on the Nintendo Entertainment System and its game library, but specifically I feature obscure and relatively unknown titles for the console, both good and bad. It's been really fun and interesting to explore, but the only downside is that I often feel like certain games are maybe too popular to discuss, while staying true to the channel's hyperbolic mission of covering NES games no one played. However, there's one very, very well-known title that's been on my mind a lot lately, and I've been itching to discuss, so screw it. Let's have some fun with the crown jewel of the NES library, Super Mario Bros. 3. Mario 3 is not only one of the best-selling NES games of all time, but it is also the perpetual critic and people's champ. Appearing at number one on just about any top NES games list you can Google produce with your little fingers. Naturally, it has been given a ton of attention and accolades over the years, with historians and critics breaking down its development, its technical programming, its graphical design, the composition of its soundtrack, and of course, its immediate and lasting cultural influence. As such, I will probably not be discussing most of that Wikipedia-ready information, and instead we'll just keep it light and spotlight a few little details that I love about Mario 3 and that I want to share with y'all. Let's hop in. For starters, I actually have three different copies of Super Mario Bros. 3. The NES version that my childhood friend and neighbor Will gave to me years ago, the Famicom cartridge which I got in a lot of games a while back, and although you'd never guess it, this guy here. This is a cartridge my friend George brought back from Serbia. For the longest time I had no idea what this was, because it never powered on correctly, but now that I can get it to work, it's, um, yeah, Mario 3. Who would have guessed from looking at this dapper fox and the words Entertainment Computer System on the cover? There's so much to point out about what makes Mario 3 special, from the graphics, to the music, to the diversity of gameplay, to the secrets and exploration, but for me its greatest achievement is the controls. This is the pinnacle of 8-bit control right here. You just always feel like you can maneuver Mario exactly how you want to. Anytime you misjudge a jump or the distance of an enemy, you never want to blame the game because it so obviously feels like it's your fault, something you should have done right. Years ago, I remember watching some wizard beat Mario 3 in about 11 minutes, and while I'm sure he had some kind of cheats in place, watching him blaze through the game while perfectly bouncing between enemies is so satisfying. Not only that, but it feels intentional, like the game is designed to be played at that level of perfection, where each enemy and pitfall is placed in a way that can be seamlessly avoided at full speed. And because the controls are so responsive, you know that it can be accomplished if you're diligent enough. Something I never thought about too closely was the plot. Usually you're trying to rescue Princess Peach after she's been kidnapped by Bowser, but in Mario 3, he doesn't actually grab her until after the 7th level boss, and he leaves the most gangster note for you. Yo, I kidnapped the princess while you were running around. <laughs> God, I love that. It reads like King Koopa's your roommate and he left you a note on the fridge reminding you to pick up toilet paper. Also, while you were running around, that's so cold. Like as the player, this whole time you think you're doing all this positive world-saving work, and all the while you're actually just fucking around, getting plumber exercise on these extreme hikes. Meanwhile, you're ignoring your girlfriend's booty call texts, and so yeah, naturally she's gonna get swooped up by the player with his priorities straight. One of the many things Mario 3 did better than anybody was the layout of each world's map stage. This was a revelation at the time, and was often imitated but never replicated. On top of the challenge of completing levels to gain new ones, or even choosing between the forking paths of varying difficulty versus reward, there's all the distractions packed in here. The backgrounds, the pipes that are often completely unnecessary but look way too cool not to use, those sweet, sweet mushroom houses that practically invented FOMO, those locks that I often never figure out how to open or why I needed to at all, the varying hammer bro mini bosses, the slide puzzles and match games, and even the way the boss ship moves if you fail to beat it, thus forcing you to potentially reattempt stages you'd skipped earlier. Each world feels like an adventure, not just choosing arbitrary levels instead of playing them sequentially, but a straight up journey where you're picking your path and chipping away at your task little by little while recharging on whatever bonuses are strewn along the way. Speaking of bonuses, the power suits are of course the most exciting thing about Mario 3, but man, what a tease! 
Aside from the raccoon suit and fireball Mario, which you can find aplenty, there's also frog Mario, tanuki Mario, and hammer bros Mario. But man, if you're lucky, you'll maybe, maybe get to try each one twice. And once you have one, it's like a brand new car you want to leave in your driveway so it doesn't get scratched. Because there is no greater sinking feeling than taking damage while in the almighty Tanuk. No! I was so close to perfection! I often lose this suit purely because I enjoy the statue ability so much that I go out of my way to use it on enemies. Worth it! And is there any image more amazing than Frog Mario riding a canoe? I know he doesn't need it to get around, but man, he does look stylish while doing it. The greatest power-up of them all is also the most temporary, Kuribo's shoe. I still lack the words to explain why exactly driving a bouncing shoe with Mario's head sticking out of it is so fun, but it is. It really is. Sadly, you can't take it any further than this stage, and it never appears again. It's such a strange idea to include, but man, am I glad they did. Also in that same stage, I accidentally stumbled on a new minigame. Check me out, getting a little footy practice in before lunch. And one and two and one and two. Speaking of unintended uses, there's something so funny to me about the match game. Like the goal is obviously to make a complete image of either a mushroom, flower, or star, but the accidental surrealisms genuinely give me way more joy to create. There's Walrus Lad, this snazzy bow tie, Grand Dragon Toad, and the Great Star Sack. I truly never get mad at missing out on the one-ups, because the mistakes never fail to make me laugh. This is the first Mario game to give you a selectable inventory, which I tend to hoard like crazy. Aside from the standard power-ups, there are some weird ones like the music box that puts the Hammer Bros to sleep, the chisel that destroys rock obstacles, the P-Wings and clouds that let you fly or skip over stages, and of course, the legendary warp whistles. I will say though, finding these whistles makes no sense. Like I get it, if they were easy to locate, the game wouldn't be challenging at all, but how would you know about acquiring any of these? The third one is the most accessible. Using the chisel item on this stone opens up a new area where you can battle for the whistle. Not obvious, but not impossible. The second one is way up here in the first castle of World 1. No idea who thought of this and committed to keep flying after the first three seconds of nothing happening, but yeah, good for you. It worked. Very secretive, but the original Mario introduced the idea of walking above the stage early on, so maybe this one is possible to figure out on your own. But the first whistle, where you need to find the white block and then hold down for five seconds until you drop into the background and then run to the right behind the stage to find the secret mushroom house? No fucking way. Growing up, I remember being blown away when the kid in the wizard figures this out on his very first time playing Mario 3. But I was into it. He was a wizard after all. But as an adult, nah dude, this is impossible. I demand some realism out of my hour and a half long commercial masquerading as a feature length film. Back to the game, there's so much detail shoved in everywhere, and even though I've played this game a million times, I never really slowed down and appreciate all of it. Like how the bricks glimmer in the light, or how the fireballs splash as they enter and exit the lava or how Toad follows you wherever you go, even if it's only looking at the tiny space right behind him. And I love how the trees, waves, flowers, and even ice blocks move perfectly in time with the music. That rules. And I could go on and on and on. It's clear that the developers spent a ton of time maximizing every single aspect of the design to make everything appear so crisp and well-defined. And then there's the enemies. Such a large and diverse cast of oddballs with distinct looks and attack patterns. There's something so satisfying about the way Mario pops up after landing on them. Whee! Speaking of satisfying, it's hard to beat letting these brick buddies jump on top of you and get question block busted, or trouncing these pop-up peeping tom guys on the ships. Get out of here, you pervs! Same goes for standing over these cannons and blocking their shots with your butt like you're a kid hovering over the water jets at a splash pad. Oof! Yep, one more shot out of cleared up. Oof, never mind. One of my favorite moments of all time is this stage, where despite all odds, I accidentally escaped the solar juggernaut. <laughs> oh my god, did that just happen? Did I kill the sun? I am God, destroyer of worlds. And there's more of these unstoppable protectors out there that in fact can be killed, like the plumber gobbling fish in world three, or even the chain chomps. Who knew? 
Also, shout out to all the working moms out there, juggling family and career, like the fish that spits out its baby, the flying Goomba whose children orbit it like tiny planets, or the squid that sprays out its short-lived young. Man, that is dedication. And I love these tiny sprites, although not as much as the baby flame with legs. No, that is some cuteness overload right there. On the other side of the size coin, there's everyone's favorite stage, World 4, where each enemy, block, and pipe is gigantic. It's hard to explain the chemical reaction taking place in your brain when you step on these giant Koopa Troopas, but it's ecstasy. And wait a minute, what the hell is this? Who let your tiny ass into big world? Security! The ships at the end of each world have always been an imposing spectacle of danger, forcing you to be precise in every step forward you make. And while I really enjoy the challenge of these stages, I especially love the before and after scenes. Am I the only one who thinks that the sound you're hearing here in the intros isn't music, but Toad crying in his unintelligible mushroom language? And man, if you don't catch the wand mid-air, you are not living your best Mario life. Nailed it! Also, I never really look too close at the various kings you rescue, and they are all amazing in their own ways. But wait a minute, is that daddy? And look at this shirtless wonder here, moving his little feet with joy. Look at him go! I also love the idea of the last boss where instead of the usual pounce on their back and avoid approach, you're instead trying to trick Bowser into throwing himself down an endless pit. Brutal. And man, I am thankful to the developers for letting me embiggen myself back to man size before greeting the princess at the end. I was in the pool! My only criticism of Mario 3, and it's not really a criticism, is that when you've played this a thousand times like I have, and you're strolling along with 50 plus lives and every power up you could want, there's really no reason to explore the levels. Like when you see an alternate path at first you're tempted to go look, but all you're really going to find there is more extra lives and more power-ups, and when you're flush with both, why bother? It's something I'd absolutely say the Super Nintendo sequels do a great job of improving on, by adding the secret exits in Super Mario World and the collectible items in Yoshi's Island. But then again, neither of those games have the item select options of Mario 3, so it's a trade-off for sure. Anyway, that's it for now. I just wanted to do a little informal tribute to my favorite NES game. I could make three more of these videos pointing out amazing details in Mario 3 and still not feel like I fully explained its greatness. This is just one of those cases where the hype is real, and even years later, I still have yet to find any 8-bit game that comes anywhere close to the level of Super Mario Bros. 3. It really is that good, and even though I've played it more times than I can count, I always feel like I discover something new every time I pop it into my Nintendo. Massive shout out to my buddy OG's oh Come On, who is a real life friend who recently joined my Patreon and for whom I've made this sign. I know he's a big Final Fantasy 7 head, so I toss in some of the NES bootleg versions of the characters. Thanks so much, bud. If you want to be like that cool cat, head on over to patreon.com slash bigawards, browse through the weekly bonus videos I make over there, and consider joining the cause. Until next time, thanks for watching.